Hey everyone, welcome. My name is Marilyn Shannon and I am so happy to have you here today. I feel like I wait for you each and every week and I can't wait for us all to come together so I can bring to you my, my guests each and every week. And you know I say every week, they're special and they are. And I'm so excited for today's show. But before we get started with that, I just want to say good afternoon to Amnon. Good afternoon, Marilyn. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm just fine. Did you have a nice weekend? I'm not I had a nice weekend. You did? And, uh, after this big shower, did it rain over at your side? It oh, rained yeah. here for about 45 minutes nonstop. The thing was sitting well, right on top. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yesterday, you know, it, was it was funny because when I came near your, your neighborhood, it was raining. When I got to mine, there was no rain. Yeah. It was it was, bizarre. it was fine. I mean, we thought that, that we're going to. Float away. away. Well, I'm glad but you didn't everything go is nice, and the good, grass is happy, and the veggies are happy. Good. It's fine. Good, good, good. Great day. Great good, beginning good, good, good. to the week. Good. Perfect. Okay, we're going to get started. So you know I love the show, and I love being here with you. And I just want to remind you all that during the show, please feel free to join us in our chat. You're more than welcome. Put your name, nickname, whatever you like. You can ask questions. You can talk, whatever. You can call in at 919 518 nine seven seven three anytime you want during the show if you have a comment a question an observation anything or you can come in at, on skype and that's on computers that's plural the number 2k voice also during the show and you'll come in on skype voice and we'd love to have you there as well so let's t uh, before we get on listen i always forget to do this and i'm going to do this right now so Here. I have a series of books that I'm involved with. Here's the first one. It's out on Amazon. It's doing great. It's called In Just One Afternoon, Listening to the Hearts of Men. And I will tell you, what I've learned and experienced from men is astounding. Men have so much to share, and you will hear and, and notice great stories in there of the how-tos and what men have gone through and how they're expressing themselves, and it's delightful. And the next one I'm doing is Twins, and I go on from there, so Amazon, check it out. Okay, my guest, here we go. Ready? Dr. Jason Miller, and I've tracked him down. Believe me, I, I, I couldn't wait for Dr. Miller to come. And Dr. Miller is a professor from North Carolina State, and he's here, and I'm delighted. Hello. Hello. It's fantastic to be here that's with good. both of you. Oh, uh, yeah. We're, that's right. We're all in the studio together. So, okay, so tell everybody who you are. So I'm a professor at North Carolina State University, and I'm in the Department of English. But by the time I finish, you might think I have a, a co-chair in the History Department, but it's the Department of English. I work with uh, teacher education folks that are going to go ahead and be future teachers, but I also am involved in a great deal of scholarship in the world of Langston Hughes. And uh, one of the really fascinating connections I've been able to make is uh, his relationship with the great Martin Luther King. And so Langston Hughes is sometimes a poet people don't know. He was born in 1902, but he didn't die until 1967, so he's often considered kind of the leading figure of the Harlem Renaissance from the 1920s. But living all the way to 1967, that's less than 11 months before Dr. King was assassinated. So as such, the two men knew each other, shared letters, and uh, even exchanged a poem that nobody knew about until some of my research. So, uh, yeah, and, and you are a snoop, and we're gonna get to, we're gonna get to how uh, Jason snoops, because it's really good. But I am fascinated by just some, you focusing on Langston Hughes, because until I actually came across you, I didn't even know Langston Hughes existed. So why and who? Yeah, so Langston Hughes is fascinating because he's a poet we know and don't know all at the same time. If you know the phrase, dream deferred, you actually know Langston Hughes. This is his signature poem, and it was written in 1947, and it's quite an honor as a researcher and a scholar to actually hold the original hand draft of the first poem, and it's dated at the top. And Hughes knew right away when he wrote this poem that he'd written something really, really powerful. Uh, he wrote, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crushed in sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? Now, the reason you actually know that poem is because the first line, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, mm. became the title for Lorraine Hansberry's great play from 1959, A Raisin in the Sun, starring Sidney Poitier and the great yeah, Ruby Dee. Yeah, I wrote Dee. that down while you were saying, oh, I got so excited. Right, <laughs> right, absolutely. Now, what's really interesting as a scholar is 
you know, we don't just look at the author's lives. We actually get to look at the artifacts and things they produce. So when Langston Hughes first wrote that poem, the end image we have is, does the dream explode? But in the handwritten draft, he actually wrote, or does it atom-like explode and leave death in its wake? So in 1947, 1948, he was actually thinking of a nuclear explosion and a bomb going off at that time. Um, but one further connection between Lorraine Hansberry and Langston Hughes is this. The final title of her play is A Raisin in the Sun. But while she was writing it, she actually had another working title. As an author and writer, you know how this works. Titles change, come in and out. The working title was called The Crystal Stair, which is based on another Langston Hughes poem called Mother to Son. So she had Langston Hughes all through her mind in that play. And when you re-see that play, you realize there's a lot about the relationship between the main character and her son as she's trying to educate him and inspire him. And that's because the title was from a poem about mothers inspiring their sons. So what is it about Langston Hughes that attracted you to make, like, your, it's like your life study? Yeah. So the first thing that attracted me to Langston Hughes was his accessibility and approachability. A lot of times when you're teaching really complex poetry that are the romantic poets or even earlier Shakespeare's sonnets, you get a lot of blank stares in classrooms, right? But when you teach a Langston Hughes poem, students go, oh, I get that. I understand what's happening or going on. I have uh, many interests. One of them is also playing the electric guitar, and so I play a great deal of blues music. And Langston Hughes really perfected the blues poem, which isn't just blues music set to poetry, but it's actually blues instincts and categories and concepts that get embedded in the poems. And so I would teach him from the very beginning, and students would just go, yeah, I get this. I didn't know poetry could be this accessible and, and unique. The fascinating thing for me was realizing then that it could still be an education even after teaching him. And so after a number of years, we realized that because Hughes was falsely accused of being a communist, his collected works really had been underground from about 1959 to 1994. And so when I came back to Hughes in graduate school in about 1999, 2000, all these poems by Langston Hughes that were radical, subversive, anti-establishment had now been found and collected and given back to us. And so it was like coming to uh, the same person with a completely different view. Um, it's like learning something very unique about a mother or father you think you know so much about, and then all of a sudden there's this brand new element to it. So from that moment on, uh, Hughes became new and, and fascinating to me. And, you know, it's the, the connections to North Carolina are amazing. Uh, Langston Hughes was actually invited into Chapel Hill in 1931. And he was invited by a couple editors of a press called Contempo, and they asked him if he would write a poem about this very, very famous case called the Scottsboro case, these eight young men falsely accused of raping two white women. And Langston Hughes responded with an incredibly volatile poem. The poem's entitled Christ in Alabama. And the editors knew they really had something, so they saved this poem until the day of the reading. They printed off 5,000 copies. Langston Hughes went in and read at Gerard Hall on the campus of Chapel Hill. The police stood guard outside the hall because they were so worried about what would happen. At the end of the night, Langston Hughes was supposed to stay another day, but he left town early because of threats and warnings. He left without being paid, and that payment was eventually sent by mail. But the fascinating thing is, it appears that Langston Hughes might have been one of the first black men to ever eat in a restaurant on Franklin Street. And Hughes did this because he was incredibly intelligent. He knew how to speak Spanish, and he had very curly hair in the back. And so what he would often do when he wanted to pass is he would walk into a restaurant or a train car, and his first words would be in Spanish. And so the proprietor or workers would think, oh, this is a Spaniard or somebody from Mexico, and they would allow him then uh, rights that unfortunately weren't allowed to many African Americans. Wow. And Chris has a couple of quotes. Let's see. She said, let the rain kiss you, let the rain mm. beat upon your head with silver liquid drops. Mm. Let the rain sing you a lullaby. Mm. Was he positive? Did he have, a, like, a positive outlook, even though he... I mean, because I, I feel like somebody who could write like this and talk about dreams has to be somebody that knows something. Well said. 
Langston Hughes, if he suffered from anything, it might have been congenital optimism. He always focused on a brighter future and brighter days. And those wonderful lines are because Langston Hughes also wrote a lot of, a lot of poems for children. And that collection that those poems is related to is called The Dream Keeper from 1932. And so a lot of aspirations for young people. And in fact, his first published poems were in the Brownies book and in this collection, The Dream Keeper. And he would say these amazingly optimistic things all about dreams uh, most often. One time he wrote a poem entitled Dreams, and he simply wrote, um, Hold fast to dreams. For when dreams die, life is a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. So yeah, watching the rain, thinking about dreams, Langston Hughes was always trying to push not only himself, but his entire race, as he would have put it, into a better place. Well, I guess you can't do it any other way, right? I mean, how else could you do it if you don't, think, if you don't come from that kind of a place? That's absolutely, you're absolutely right. And in a couple of phrases for dealing with this, uh, one he would say, you know, I'm just laughing to keep from crying. <laughs> so the humor masks the deep pain. But the more interesting thing is he actually gave a speech in uh, 1957 in Chicago, the Windy City Press Club. And his whole theme that day was since we haven't been able to argue dominant culture into giving us our rights, Maybe we should use humor and see if we can laugh them into being kinder. <laughs> and so he found humor could be a weapon, which, of course, is a very Marxist trait as well. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it's so interesting. I'm 63 years old, you know, and, and being exposed to some of this at this age, I'm falling in love with this type of, with, with this type of brilliance. And mm -hmm. it's amazing to me. Because when, when I read some of him, and I didn't make this extraordinary study, but you know, just even covering the surface, and you realize where the man came from, and the the brilliance of of the feelings that are coming out, and the intelligence. Because how can you do it? Any, you know, it's amazing. Yes, and for any of those artists out there, I know you're doing a great deal of writing, and a lot of other folks are writing or painting or doing a number of things. Listening, uh, Langston Hughes said. Poems don't last long. They're like rainbows. And so when that moment of inspiration comes, you have to work on it right at that time, at that moment. You can't just think about it or file it away often. And he really had that kind of tone. And I think that's one of the reasons, Marilyn, while Martin Luther King reached out to Langston Hughes in 1959 and said, would you write a special poem for a one-time occasion to celebrate A. Philip Randolph's birthday? And so the research was in book form, and now we're working on it in a film. That film is called Origin of the Dream, and you can follow us on Facebook. And last weekend, our director and co-producer, our director is Rebecca Cerise, and our co-producer is Cash Michaels. Uh, they've both done outstanding work on other films, including the first documentary on the Greensboro sit-ins called February 1, and also telling the story of the Wilmington 10 uh, called Pardons of Innocence. But last weekend, we had a tremendous film shoot because we brought this secret hidden poem to life. So this poem had been buried in the archives. Martin Luther King asked Langston Hughes, would you write a poem to celebrate A. Philip Randolph's 70th birthday? We want to open up Carnegie Hall and make it free to the public. And Langston Hughes was honored. He said, of course I would. And so he worked and worked and drafted this great poem. It's called Poem for a Man. And this had never appeared anywhere in print until I was able to find it and, and bring it to light. And what's unique about it is the very subject of the poem is about dreams. And when Martin Luther King went to speak that night in 1960, he started praising A. Philip Randolph as being a man who had the capacity to dream, who was a dreamer. And then later on in the evening, because A Raisin in the Sun was so popular at that time in 1960, the great Ruby D, who was starring in the play in the lead role, came out and performed that poem about dreams. But it was a fascinating sequence of events because what had happened chronologically for those there was that Martin Luther King had started talking about dreams, and then Langston Hughes's poem seemed to second the motion, as if Martin Luther King brought the motion to the table and King just seconded it. But the reality was quite different. Langston Hughes had been writing about dreams since the 1930s, again in his great collection, Montage of a Dream Deferred in 1951, and even in this particular poem. So, depending on your ilk, if you're a scholar like me, you would say and know that Langston Hughes was signifying on Martin Luther King. 
If you're a high school English teacher or you remember those classes as a senior, you'd know that he was alluding to Langston Hughes when Dr. King started talking about dreams. Or if you're into music and the great jazz era, you'd say he riffed on Langston Hughes. Or if you're much more current today, you would say that Martin Luther King sampled Langston Hughes. (laughs) And all of those things are true because he both gave a nod to the past and yet he also updated it for the present condition of trying to make things better. So... Let's should we show the book cover? Because she just sure. mentioned it. Let's uh... and then we're gonna go back. Okay, so your you this is your book. Took you how long to do? Yeah, so it's very interesting. Uh, Scholarship of this kind of uh, nature is more like building pyramids and raising tents. So it's an eight-year process, and it began with a a previous study on Langston Hughes that I'd written about his poems about lynching. It's called Langston Hughes and American Lynching Culture. And at the end of that, I started recognizing this connection between Hughes's poems and Martin Luther King's work. And it was quite startling. A lot of things don't have beginnings, but this actually did. I walked over to my library's fifth floor and I said, I wonder if there is any connection between Martin Luther King's great dream and Langston Hughes's poems. And the first book I pulled off the shelf of about five rows was called The Trumpet of Conscience. And I went to the back table of contents of the index at the back, and there was no mention of Langston Hughes. But when I flipped through it, I got to page 76. And in the sermon, Martin Luther King is saying that I am personally the victim of deferred dreams. And I said to myself, I can't believe that the first book I'm looking at, he's already referencing Langston Hughes. By the end of the day, I found three different poems that he'd used. And by the end of the eight years of research, I found eight different poems by Langston Hughes that Martin Luther King used, but not only referenced like a scholar, but actually and quite often memorized. And so he had completely internalized Langston Hughes' ideas, and he would deliver these. And these go from his entire career. So why does that matter? It matters for two huge reasons. One, it matters to Langston Hughes because it reminds us that Hughes' poetry, when used by Dr. King, was as important to the civil rights movement as it was to the Harlem Renaissance. So we can't just say Langston Hughes wrote in the 20s and 30s and that's his era. His poetry had a great impact on the 1960s. For Martin Luther King, it matters dramatically because we always see him as a prophet. And we think Old Testament Psalms, we think of Amos, we think of Isaiah. That thread is clearly in Dr. King's sermons and great dream speech. We sometimes think of him as being very political, and so the idea of the American dream is another thread that runs through his great I Have a Dream. But the third missing thread that connects those two is poetry. And when I trace Dr. King's speeches all the way back to 1956, not just looking at the one great I Have a Dream speech in the March of Washington of August 28, 1963, you can see that it goes in this pattern. The last thing he added to his I Have a Dream was the prophetic element of the Bible. The thing before that actually took place in 1960 in Greensboro as he started talking about the American dream. Mm -hmm. But for four years prior to that, he was talking about the poetry of Langston Hughes, poems like Dream Deferred and then another great poem, I Dream a World. And so poetry, politics, and prophecy These are the three threads that unite Dr. King. And it's no surprise when you really think about it, Marilyn. We remember the metaphor of the dream. We don't remember the argument. We don't remember that there's allusions to Amos and Isaiah. And it's because poetry is where memory breathes. And so to activate a metaphor like dreaming is what makes the speech memorable not only effective and powerful, but unforgettable. And what does that tell us about Martin Luther King? It tells us a lot of things about Dr. King. It tells us that he had a great, deep love of literature. And it was overwhelming to me to go down to Atlanta at the Woodruff Library and see their entire collection of Dr. King's personal books and see what he was reading. And when you do this kind of scholarship, they actually bring out these foam V-shapes And they set down the book and they give you white gloves because they don't even want any oils from your body touching these pages. And so these books come out and you'll see that in 1961, Martin Luther King was reading entire volumes of poetry. 
He's reading Emily Dickinson. He was reading Robert Frost. And what's fascinating is like a lot of us who are really invested in uh, marginalia and making notes is he did what a lot of us do. He wrote his favorite poems down on the front cover of this one particular book. And he took blue ink and he wrote down 10 page numbers. And I knew as a scholar, these were his favorite poems in the book. And then when you go back to the book and you track his own markings, you can see that nine out of those 10 poems, he liked the endings. <laughs> So he loved the dramatic punch to finish things off where something really hit home. And so you can see that extra focus in his own speeches as well. So when we started talking before, um, we invited the world in to listen. <laughs> you and I were chatting a little bit, and I, like usual, always say, I don't want to talk about this now. I want to wait till my friends are here. Right. Um, so the th you are not the expert on Martin Luther King. He was not your focus necessarily your focus was Langston Hughes right exactly okay and things came about but but what is it about Martin Luther King that you discovered that nobody else did so it really is this element of the poetic okay. and we've paid attention to his importance in history we've been paid attention to his use of the Bible we really have a deep understanding of everything he did from the Montgomery bus boycott all the way to the end of the Poor People's Campaign in Memphis, Tennessee. And in looking for all these sources, no one had paid attention to his love of literature. And it's fascinating because if you go all the way back to his GRE scores, the things he had, the tests he had to take to get into Boston University to earn his Ph.D., the only category that he scored exceptionally in, all other categories, he was in the 33rd percentile or less, things like religion and philosophy and science. The only thing he scored well in, in the top third, was literature. And so it's amazing when you go back and watch him speak or you hear some of these sermons, you figure, oh, these are moments where he has his text in front of him and he's reading. But quite often you'll see him actually recite poetry from memory and then two or three lines have to go down to his actual text to get the verse from the Bible. <laughs> In other words, his note cards, his personal affinity was for the poetic word and language and he knew that better than he knew Paul's epistles. And so this is actually very measurable in a number of ways. First and foremost, his own personal note cards, he kept far more collected works on Psalms and Proverbs than he did on the New Testament. So he loved the elements of language that were at play. But what's really unique is, remember the era. A lot of these sermons are delivered and then someone types up the transcript. There are places where he is quoting obscure poems by Josiah Holland, Douglas Malick, and the transcribers don't know when the poem starts and Dr. King's words begin. Wow. <laughs> because he a lot of times would bring his own poems actually into the sermons. And he knew these poems so well, I won't get too scholarly on you, but okay. many of us are familiar with sonnets, eight lines and then six lines. Dr. King knew poems so well that when he wanted to show transitions, there's actually a poem by Josiah Holland called Wanted. He took that eight stanza, the eight line structure and he moved it to the bottom and he rewrote a new six lines on top. And what he was doing was he was talking about a world where everything was turned upside down and changed. And he actually took the, the creative liberty to reinvent these poems because he knew them. He knew poetry that well. I mean, I'm sitting here and I'm, my head is going back and forth. I'm making myself dizzy. <laughs> right. <laughs> because I'm, this is, I mean, for me, this is like, bring, make, this is creating this man again, but, you know, like for the first time. As a human, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, he, when we think of Dr. King and so many hats that he wore, all the things that he had to do and the responsibilities, uh, to think of Martin Luther King as a poet is a new way of thinking of him in this particular way. And, you know, this isn't just some kind of error in his life. It isn't like Picasso's blue period. <laughs> right, right, right. King is poetic from start to finish. When he was wooing Coretta, his future wife, the first thing he did was started reciting Shakespeare's sonnets to her because he wanted to really impress her. And even to the very end of his life, this relationship with Langston Hughes is amazing because uh, Langston Hughes on his deathbed actually took out pen and paper and wrote a handwritten letter to Martin Luther King and delivered it. Um, that letter has been missing, and I've been searching for it for about four years. We do not know what happened to it. 
what its content said, but it's amazing to think about one of the last things Langston Hughes wanted to do in this world was contact Martin Luther King one more time, and he did. And how do you know this letter exists? It's fascinating. <laughs> it's fascinating because I actually have a 14-foot by 3-foot scroll at home, and it has every connection across it between 1956 and 1968 between Dr. King and Martin Luther King, every letter they exchanged, every poem that Langston Hughes sent, every time that they met in person, and what's fascinating is what would have been called Dr. King's secretary at that time, his assistant, Dora McDonald, wrote back a postcard to Langston Hughes, said, Dr. King has received your letter. He is out of town, and he will respond as soon as he returns. And so what happened is from the time that Dr. King came back, Langston Hughes died in the hospital. And so his return letter was never sent, but that postcard is dated confirming that they have that letter. Wow. So wouldn't you like to know what's yeah, on there? Yeah, I want yeah, and, oh. I, and you're going to find it cuz you Sometime. tell every tell everybody about your detective work in finding the first ver I guess it was the first yeah. version of I Have a Dream. Yeah, so it's really unique because scholars for many many years have realized that Dr. King's great I Have a Dream speech could actually be traced to a speech from 1956. So the I Have a Dream speech we all know is from 1963. But Dr. King had been working on a series of speeches in 1956 entitled um, The Birth of a New Nation, or sometimes simply called um, Remaining Awake During the Revol Revolution. And in this series of speeches, people have said, well, if you look at the end, there's the quote from Amos, there's the quote from Isaiah, and he's talking about a new world, a better world, a world that doesn't look like ours today. And so I went back to this speech from August 11th, 1956, and I said, you know, what if we took the last lines Martin Luther King is delivering and typed them out as poetry instead of running them margin to margin what as prose? What makes you think of that? An obsession. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Nothing less than pure obsession. I mean, and why did you, what were you looking for? I heard a cadence and a rhythm in this end uh, of this in the end of this uh, sermon. Um, that resembled Langston Hughes's most important poem. It's a poem entitled, I Dream a World. Uh -huh. And people for a number of uh, years in my world of scholarship have wondered if that was the poem that Dr. King knew. And so I had that poem floating around. I had the concept. And then when I came to it, I saw Dr. King was repeating a world in which, a world in which, a new world. And so what had happened, Marilyn, is he focused on the metaphor of a new world before he focused on the metaphor of a dream. And when I retyped out those 19 lines, I realized they matched perfectly for rewriting Langston Hughes's poem, I Dream a World. Now, when you hear Langston Hughes's poem, if you were to add Martin Luther King's voice, you'd say, that sounds exactly like I have a dream. It's the same idea, it's the same language, and it's the same um, anaphora, which is the repetition of sounds at the beginning of a line. So Dr. King's great phrase is obviously, I have a dream, the most recognizable speech in American history, period. Langston Hughes's poem that he ended most of his poetry readings with is I Dream a World. And here's what he wrote and what Dr. King rewrote. Langston Hughes wrote in 1941, I dream a world where man no other man will scorn where love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul, nor avarice blights our day. A world I dream, I have a dream? A world I dream in which black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth and every man is free, where wretchedness will hang its head and joy like a pearl attends the needs of all mankind. Of such I dream our world. And so Dr. King found a way to reinvigorate that concept, combine it with our political animus of the American dream, and then bring it into the collective language of the Bible and make it prophetic so that all his listeners, whether they were fans of Langston Hughes, whether they were people who thought everyone should have access to the American dream, or if they were simply people who appreciated the certainty and inevitability of Old Testament prophecy could hear resonances of their own beliefs when Dr. King said, I have a dream. Wow. 
So, so you did that, and then that sent you on the goose case, goose. Tra what am I? Wild goose chase that ended up being fabulous. But yep. is that I wrote down "Let Freedom, freedom Ring" because yeah. didn't you? Because I thought I read or somewhere that you that there were three parts. Yes. Right? Gotcha. Okay. So, which you talk about whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that really is startling. Dr. King has three famous endings that he used at different points in his career. The famous let freedom ring phrase, which he also borrowed. I'm being very generous in my language. He also borrowed directly from Archibald Carey, another speaker who in 1952 gave a very public speech before the Republican National Convention, and he used those lines of uh, let freedom ring, not only here but in the south, in the mountains of Appalachia, and in, in the hills of um, the great curvaceous slopes of the Colorados. His other famous phrase is the idea that he asked a question, it seems to be from one of the Psalms, how long, not long, and then he would answer this question. This was such an important set piece at the end of his sermons and speeches that the great ending march in, at Selma in 1965 was called How Long Not Long. So we have him taking Let Freedom Ring and we have this How Long Not Long, but what's fascinating is the first time, the first time he ever said I have a dream took place in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, November 27th, 1962. Now, that's shocking to us. It's like having a new reading of Genesis. These are things we just think we know, and we can't imagine there being new evidence about. How could it be that someone would find that Abraham Lincoln gave another version of the Gettysburg Address? That didn't happen. That would, like, that would like freak everybody out, right? Yes, and so yeah. what absolutely did happen is Dr. King used his I Have a Dream phrase many, many times, and the first one we ever have documented took place in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Now, what's fascinating is we don't just have eyewitness testimony. We don't just have a number of people who are saying, oh, yeah, I remember that, or we don't just have a newspaper account. What I was able to do on my wild goose chase <laughs> was actually locate the seven-inch reel-to-reel tape that has the entire 55-minute speech of Dr. King saying, I have a dream. And we were able, with the help of a number of people in the city of Rocky Mount and a number of other incredible experts, to digitize that tape, but not only digitize it and make it available, but actually restore it. So if we just digitized it from its current form to a digital form, there are still parts you couldn't hear. And if you had to create a transcript, it would be filled with guess words and question marks. But fortunately, we found a man named George Blood in Philadelphia. That's kind of an unforgettable name, isn't it? George Blood. Yeah, really. <laughs> and I said, I have a, I called him up and I said, George, I need you to kind of work on something for me. I said, I, I have a tape. And he said, well, just put that in the mail and send it on and I'll get it back to you in three weeks. I said, no, you don't understand. <laughs> this is the first time Dr. King ever said, I have a dream. And he said, can you be here Sunday? <laughs> So I drove the tape up personally, and he actually restored it right in front of my eyes. And it was amazing. He would slow sections down and speed others up so we can hear the complete version. The connection was that this speech is a revised speech of the 1956 one that I was talking about. So when he first started saying, I, a new world, now he took that same speech and was bold enough to talk about dreaming. And so he now was dreaming of a new world, just like he had. And when did he actually meet Langston Hughes? So they met several times. The most interesting one is the two men actually shared a flight from London to Nigeria. And again, this had not been covered in detail, but what had happened is uh, the Nigerian's first um, president of native background Nanamde Azikwe was elected what's called Governor General of Nigeria, our equivalent of the President of the United States. And it was such a big deal for the continent of Nigeria that he wanted all dignitaries that he could get from around the world to attend. And so he reached out to the ever-famous Langston Hughes and the newly popular Martin Luther King, and he invited them down there. And so with about 40 other men, they took a, a charter flight from London to Lagos, Nigeria, and they arrived, and they sat out of this gigantic racetrack, November 16, 1960, and lo and behold, when the governor general gets ready to end his continent-shaking speech, he quotes a poem from Langston Hughes, line by line. 
So imagine this. You're in Nigeria in 1960 at the after party, and I have all the invitations and everywhere that the two men went. And these two giants of American culture walk into a tent together, and everybody is dying to shake hands with Langston Hughes, not Martin Luther King. That was the reality because Hughes had built up such a reputation internationally. His poems had been published in the English-speaking country of Nigeria, and he had been known over and over again. And when the governor general quoted his poem, Youth, which had been famous since the 1930s, Langston Hughes was once again an immediate star. So uh, you said you have this timeline. So, so Langston Hughes and Martin Luther King, at what point did they actually get to, get to know that each other existed uh, around the times of some of these speeches, say, I, uh, A New World or I Have a Dream? Yeah. I mean, where, would, where did that sure. fit in? Sure. So, uh, again, this is mind-boggling for us. When Martin Luther King is on the scene and becomes famous, he's 26 years old. He's so young, you can't even believe it. He was elected leader of the Montgomery bus boycott because there were two rival pastors in town, and neither one of them wanted the other person to be the leader. So they picked the new guy in Montgomery that nobody knew about that was neutral, and he became the leader. For years, Martin Luther King had known about Langston Hughes. And the real connection is because Coretta Scott King was a tremendous fan of Langston Hughes. Mm. She performed several of his poems in public to, to audition for roles, which she often got. And with Andrew Young, the great ambassador Andrew Young, she had gone uh, with Andrew Young's wife. Coretta Scott King and Andrew Young's wife had seen Langston Hughes when they were 13 years old when he toured through their town. And so from her teenage years, teenage years, Coretta Scott King was enamored with Langston Hughes. Martin Luther King had the same feelings because Langston Hughes was the poet of the African-American people all through his youth. Mm. So Dr. King comes on the scene December 1955. By 1956, the boycott's still going on at the beginning of his career. And Langston Hughes writes a poem about the bus boycott called Brotherly Love. Now, when Dr. King, the young 26-year-old, realizes that Langston Hughes is writing about him, he can't believe it. And you can literally see within days, he starts using three different Langston Hughes poems in his sermons because he's thrilled about this. So Langston Hughes knew about Martin Luther King from the beginning of 1957 when there are a number of youth marches that took place in Washington. There wasn't just the Great March on Washington. There was a number of marches before that that happened annually in May, and usually around May 17th, there'd be 50, 30, 40,000 people that would attend every year. And Langston Hughes had gone one year, and he wrote about the event in, in his kind of his mast voice, this guy named Jesse B. Simple. So Martin Luther King knew about Langston Hughes his whole childhood. Langston Hughes mm-hmm. found out about Dr. King immediately and started writing about him. And the two met on several occasions, that trip in 1960, the letter at the end of his life, and also a number of um, kind of conferences when Dr. King would come to New York City. Wow. Whew. Okay, we got a lot. But I want to just remind you all to please feel free to call us at 919-518-9773 from wherever you are, if you have a landline, cell phone, or you can come in on computers, 2K Voice. That's computers, plural, the number 2K Voice on Skype, or you can join us in the chat. So I have a couple of uh, maybe a couple of quick little questions in here. Question number one, did you ever learn whether Hughes ever felt like Martin Luther King had taken his ideas? Yes. And it's very interesting because there's a letter written by an actor named Frederick O'Neill. O'Neill writes to Langston Hughes because he just quoted two poems and received some money in Tennessee. And he says, I feel a little bit guilty. I don't know if some royalty should be paid to you. Here's $10. So in 1967, he sends Langston Hughes a check for $10. Langston Hughes often had piles of mail, piles. And on this rare occasion, he answered on the same day. And he wrote back and he said, pay me. I don't think anyone's ever thought to do that. It's an amazing thing. And completely unprovoked, he starts the next paragraph by saying, I don't know why, but Martin Luther King comes to mind. He often reads my poems before great big audiences that take up great big collections, but I've never been paid anything. So Langston Hughes, at the very least, had this unbelievably conflicted feeling. Mm. His poems had been at the centerpiece of the civil rights movement, which he was incredibly proud of, 
and yet had been overlooked and sometimes ignored for important reasons at some points to keep uh, the movement from being aligned with communist accusations. But he went to his grave telling certain friends that he did believe Dr. King's great dream was based on his own poems. But that w- it would appear that they were like friends, right, or no? Absolutely. Uh, they were at different stages of the career, but absolutely men of the same thinking for the same cause, united. Mm-hmm. And you can see this most visibly at Dr. King's most controversial moment. In 1967, Dr. King speaks out against the Vietnam War before anybody else does. And when he does that, a number of African-American leaders are really mad because they're worried that now Lyndon Johnson isn't going to give the same kind of funding to a number of the mm-hmm. causes for the NAACP. And so Langston Hughes attends a banquet where all these leaders, Roy Wilkins and others, are saying they're so mad, this is what he writes to a friend, everyone's so mad at Martin Luther King they could clux him. And he says, me, no, I love the man. And there's no small reason that Langston Hughes loved him because in that same speech he quoted another great poem of his called "Let America Be America." So, so did he want to get paid, or he, or was just being f- funny about it? So, I believe that Langston Hughes would have wanted to be recognized for it. He had given up okay. long ago about making money. He'd okay. had a number of failures on Broadway. He had things stolen from him, mm-hmm. rights that weren't given. And so he'd really given up hope okay. of actually making money. But the recognition and the prestige would be something that I think one person told me you'd have to be human to not want. Mm-hmm. Not wow. be human. Isn't this fascinating? Love this. Okay. Um, so here's a question. What was the most remarkable thing, personal and or private, that happened, I guess, to you when, when Martin Luther King recording was released to the world or in general? Well, how did the world shift? Or, or I know you're doing the book, but now you're doing the movie. So, What changed and what was absolutely uh, overwhelming is we found the effects that speech had on the actual residents of the city of Rocky Mountain. And so for our film, Origin of the Dream, we've interviewed six different people who attended that speech when they were 12 years old, 9 years old, 14 years old. And to Mm -hmm. see what's become of their lives and to see how they point to that moment as absolutely life-changing is overwhelming. We're talking about people that are senators now, like Angela Bryant, women like Helen Gay, who at the time served Dr. King a meal and then later became one of the first African-American city council members in the entire state, People like Reverend Omakunde, who now pointed that moment where he sat down and shared a Coca-Cola with Dr. King in the school library before the speech and said, I need to become a pastor. This list goes on and on and on of people who have dedicated themselves to the community and made measurable change. And so meeting people that attended that speech, having them hear the speech again and then be transported back thinking they would have never had a chance to be there again and hear those words is really the impetus for documenting this in our film, Origin of the Dreams, to get this connection to the city of Rocky Mount, to its people. And what's fascinating, Marilyn, is the site where he spoke, Booker T. Washington Gymnasium, still stands. And so um, to be able to interview these people and shoot on location for a film at these destinations is a rarity in this day and age. And it by far and away is the most remarkable thing. In fact, the pastor who invited Dr. King, his son showed up at one of my book events. And he stood up and he said, I'm George Dudley Jr. And my dad is the one that invited Dr. King. And we all just sat down and listened to him talk for 15 minutes about how well his dad knew Dr. Martin Luther King, why he invited him and what that had meant. And so to have this history be something you can actually touch that's a rare thing because we usually just think about it something that you can read. But these people, their stories and the events, they're still very, very alive. And it's amazing because I, I love stories, right? And so when I'm sitting here, I'm thinking so, prior to what you said, I'm like, okay, so what, right? But really, I mean, being able to still bring it to life through these stories Absolutely, and it's it's one thing to talk about Dr. King, and it's one thing to know the evidence or find the letters, but when you hear this audio tape, and it's available online at kingsfirstdream.com, we have the entire transcript, the history, photographs, 
why he came, the original press coverage. There's 90 annotations of the speech. You can find out every reference that he's made. When you hear Dr. King, there's just no substitute for this. And I have a chance to play that around the state and around the country, and there are literally people that will just start weeping because they'll remember that era, that time, and the power of what still is a dream deferred for many. So is it ironic that this would be coming up now? Is it, it's almost like woo-woo at its, on steroids. Yes, uh, and, and what's, what's amazing is that you find that there's many ways to try to talk about history. When you really get into history, you learn right away that it's not an hourglass, or it's not a pendulum, it's a river, it moves forward. But history is also like a spring that's been laid on its side and flattened. There's progression and movement forward, and then you come all the way back further back than you were before, and then you move forward again. Mm -hmm. And so this is actually embedded in Dr. King's use of Langston Hughes. He was reanimating Langston Hughes because the fight of the 30s and the 20s and the Red Summer of 1919 still hadn't been achieved. The uh, double victory of World War II that we would fight racism abroad and not have equality here made no sense in the 1940s. And so that is exactly what Dr. King's doing when he reaches back to get Langston Hughes. He's saying we need to bring these old arguments back again. And so this is exactly what we're doing with our film project right now is putting us in the context of today's politics, of gerrymandering, of everything that everyone knows about, and saying um, these are things we're still working towards and trying to achieve. And, and just as Dr. King reached back to Langston Hughes, we're reaching back to Dr. King one more time. And you say we. Yes. But you are a white man doing this, and Danny Glover, right? Yes. So, I mean, just how does that work? How does it work that Dr. King did this, now you're doing this? Yeah, it's an amazing thing because uh, you get these connections that touch so many people, and you get people on all sides of the aisle, of all race, of all creed, of all ages that recognize a, a sense of justice and fighting for it. And so... You know, when we got the project going, we were able to have the actor Danny Glover come in and give a performance at NC State last September, and he did a 45-minute reading of Langston Hughes' greatest poems in his best voice, and so that's a part of our feature film as well, is being able to show that video and hear those words and connect those things. And um, so you find that there are these people that seem to be separated and disparate just as the internet is itself, right? right? That really combine for the same types of causes and the same types of movements. And there's a sense of, of what Dr. King said, which is the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And there are many people along that arc, and the more that we can all get together seems to me a really good way forward. Yeah, and, and it's interesting how the information is relayed, I mean, who the messengers are. It's part of the shock, I think. You think? I think so, absolutely. And uh, it's remarkable because our director uh, always talks about how there's a really safe space created by documentary films to talk about really tough issues. After people have collectively sat through an experience where they've all seen the same story, whatever it is, whether it's about the Greensboro sit-ins or whether it's about people like Ben Chavis uh, finally being pardoned for his involvement with the Wilmington 10, collectively then people are willing to talk about it because they feel like they're talking about the film rather than today, but they're really talking about today. Yeah, I guess you can't separate it out, right? And, and I did ask you before we actually went live, and um, so maybe we can just touch upon this. You know, when I was listening to you and I'm thinking, oh, Dr. Dr. King was such a romantic, right? And then I do know that Langston Hughes, it was alluded that he was gay. So I was questioning whether or not Dr. King was gay as well. And you said no. Right. It's very interesting. There are a number of very, very prominent people that would suggest that Dr. King may have had a few moments in his life, uh, and they'll point to a few uh, incidents of his closest circle. But the overwhelming evidence, and this again, I defer to people like David Garrow, who won a Pulitzer Prize for writing about Dr. King and his biography, Bearing the Cross, would say that Dr. King's great um, sexual activity with women 
um, is really the defining story, and that has been well documented and connected in a number of, of different ways. And so it, it's hard to point that other direction when there's so many incidents of the other kind that uh, lead the headline. Obviously, we know that all these things can be tied up and connected in any number of ways, but when people do talk about Dr. King's sexuality, they talk about promiscuity with women, not with other men. Well, sometimes that's a cover. So as far as you are you're concerned, the work that you've been able to accomplish, where you are, like, how do you feel about what you've accomplished? With what, I mean, this is you know, an obsession, but yet an obsession so important and brought to light. It's interesting that you ask that because it is very difficult often to kind of look back. Um, in many ways, I'm always still looking forward. There's the film we're working on. There's a number of other projects related to this and interconnected. I think what's really unique is you get the opportunity in this role to share something you're passionate and interested about with other people, and then to find out other people care is really, really rewarding. So at a university, whether it's uh, Chapel Hill, Duke, or NC State, where I'm at, there are all kinds of scholars doing fascinating work, but often the scope of people interested in that work is really limited, right? It's a very small group of people. When all of a sudden you're interested in something and it branches out to two of the leading icons in American history and other people get interested, it's very, very rewarding because you um, kind of find yourself as if you've been riding with your back to the world and you turn around and the arena's full. Mm -hmm. And that's a really wonderful thing because you kind of remember the motives and the beginnings and, uh, and then that audience also pushes you further. Yeah. So it's a co-creative act and it is very rewarding. Jason, that was beautiful. You know, when, I, when my book came out and you know, my, my mother was buying it, my brothers, you know, people that I knew, and then somebody came over to me one day somewhere and said, I just bought your book, and I really liked it. I was shocked because she wasn't in my circle. I only expected, you know, my circle. And then I realized, oh, my God, this is real and how exciting. But you just said that so beautifully. Thank you for and, – and – Thank you for being here. Well, it's been my pleasure. This is a real treat, and thank you for a chance to share, and thank you for your passion and interest in this topic. Uh, it's, it's made this incredibly rewarding. Well, I appreciate it. And so tell everybody once again about your book and the, the movie, when it will be out, and everything. So if you're a reader, the book's called Origins of the Dream, and it's available at all the typical places. You can find it at Amazon. You can find it at uh, bookstores. You can order it online. The documentary film, which we're in production with, you can follow us on Facebook. It's Origin, without an S, Origin of the Dream. And stay tuned for updates, including the filming we did last week, uh, bringing this poem to life that was uh, requested by Dr. King. And then if you're really interested in uh, hearing Dr. King deliver his first ever I Have a Dream speech, you can go to the website kingsfirstdream.com, and it's all run together. And the speech is there, the words are there, the history, the background is there. And um, so those would be the, the best ways to follow us right now. And then what's next for you? Well, what's next is um, making this history not only available on film, but also connecting to the local folks in our area. And so we're talking to a number of really big institutions uh, locally and nationally about making this into a history exhibit where people can experience this in person. So... Um, I'm still week to week, day to day, talking to people that uh, are interested in how we can make this history more visibly known. And there's amazing connections with even people at Chapel Hill that have some Langston Hughes poems that were handwritten and autographed. So showing those along with the story uh, to make it for a new generation that may not have known Dr. King ever set foot in North Carolina. Yeah, I think it, it and, and would certainly, this is a global thing but I think that what's so interesting is being able to capture the still memories that you don't even know exist you know there are so many people that have been touched right absolutely and you know when we made the the international release of the audio tape available within 10 days I received photographs of the speech 
of Dr. King speaking. Now, I'd been looking for images and photos, but they'd been buried, and they were nearly thrown out at the curb. So we also have photographs of Dr. King speaking, and when you get it in the context of the people in the background, it's really, really unique. Really powerful, isn't it? I mean, this is like just happening now for the first time for me. Absolutely, and it's amazing because we're so close to the community, we've actually been able to document who is laughing in the background during the speech because people remember their favorite pastor's distinctive laugh and cackle. And so we have details that you just can't imagine. And you got to do it now. That's right. I'm nine. What were you going to say? I was, I was going to ask, in all these years, have you ever felt yourself being ridiculed, shunned, blacklisted, like pushed out of certain circles? Because of all, because of sure. bringing it up. Yeah. And there have been a few moments where I've had a number of people kind of give me that quizzical look. Um, why are you doing this? <laughs> but what I found, and I've learned from a number of other scholars, is by the time someone gets the sense of your authenticity and the way you're going about it and what your goals are, those things change quickly. So think about this for a second. How many people, if they had a chance to have their hands on the first ever I Have a Dream speech, their first thought is, how can I make this available to the world rather than, can't I sell this? Right. And so a lot of times your motives will override those things. It takes a while, and it's building relationships. But, yeah, you certainly face that, and, and I think in a lot of fields as well. Did either, so does, did Langston Hughes have any children? He did not. He was never married. That's what it was. Yes. Well, you never know. I know. I, I mean, know. so, I was, right. Right. And so it's very interesting on his side of things because uh, the estate has kind of fallen into a number of people's hands and kind of looking over things, and they do a fantastic job. Um, but he does not have children and heirs this particular way, which is really interesting because you think of the, the, the tree that he comes from. The family tree is so full of so many incredible people. Um, John Mercer Langston, who the last name became his first name, was the first senator uh, of African-American descent in the country from Virginia. Uh, Louis Leary, Leary fought at the Battle of John Brown, at John Brown's raid. And so these people in his background are really noteworthy and known, and yet the, the, the line ends with Langston. Wow, hasn't this been great? I mean, Jason, I, I'm so delighted and you, and you are the, I mean, the perfect person to be doing this, really. And I appreciate your bringing this to life, you know, and being approachable with this information because, you know, you hear, the, you hear it and you can feel it. I mean, Chris wrote in here, which I, I love this, this. We, we Negro rioters, just by being black, have been on the blacklist all our mm -hmm. lives. Censorship for us begins at the color line. The, Whoa! Yes, yeah, and, and Langston Hughes is very in tune with that last phrase um, because he called himself nothing more than a literary sharecropper, uh, that he had written all these things and done these particular things, and he had talked about those same exact ideas and concepts, and absolutely, um, he, he felt it his entire life. Uh, I, this is a very interesting visual. Robert Frost is one of the most known poets in the world. His entire set of poems is about this big. It's 600 poems. If you take Langston Hughes' collected works, they are 17 volumes. They're about two and a half feet mm -hmm. long because he had to write so much and to get paid so little. And so the prolific nature of how much he wrote, his schedule, starting at midnight and ending at 7 a.m. and then sleeping to 2 in the afternoon, um, hard work, I think, is something that almost anybody can revere, and, and Hughes worked. Wow. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, and, you know, go look, go, go read the book, go listen to the words, go, I mean, just, it's, it's daunting, really. And I want to thank you for being here, and remember, my book, In Just One Afternoon, Listening into the Hearts of Men, you can find it on Amazon, you can... Contact me at Marilyn at MarilynShannon.com. Any questions you have about anything, please do that. Follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Marilyn Listens. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week, as always. And bless you. Thank you. Bless you, Marilyn. Bye, everybody. I'm done. Mwah. Bye.
You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.